Okay. Awesome. We're good. Here we go. So I'm going to be talking to you today about an exhibition that I did a year ago for the Sundrum Tagore Gallery in New York, in Chelsea. And as you can see, the title of the exhibition uh, will be pertinent as we talk about the exhibition more. So my vision for this exhibition began brewing after New Narratives, which is the exhibition that Barbara just mentioned in 2007. In that exhibition, <clears throat> all the engaging stories. Hold on one second. Could everybody go mute, please? Thank you. All set? OK. In that exhibition, there, there were many engaging stories that were told within the idiom of recognizable figurative form. But after that exhibition, I started wondering if the content of the work was, could not be so immediately recognizable. Could form itself provide a narrative, you know, or at least the once, once upon a time of one. To answer that rhetorical question, I started to seek out artists who had chosen the language of abstraction that would place their work within a less familiar lineage of narrative art making. All of the artists in the exhibition <clears throat> have let materials lead them. Somebody's still not on mute, and that's coming up funny. Is everybody on mute? Okay. I'm getting a little feedback here. Anyway. Um, the processes of alteration have put all of their chosen media to new purposes, and the narratives end up being revealed without the weighty presence of figurative art. Now, we know that abstraction is not new to India. There is a hands-on tradition of making things. And so this exhibition is about where those two forces, that, that idea of abstraction and the idea of hands-on meet in this exhibition, the works that I've chosen for this exhibition. The artists work in this exhibition directly. Betty, sorry to interrupt, but there is some somebody who is not mute, and I'm getting all of this and rattling. Sherry, Sherry, honey. Uh, no, I'm on I'm mute. It doesn't show up on my. No, it doesn't show that you are. Well, there. Somebody's still walking around. I can hear it. Right. Anu. And Anu isn't on mute. Sorry to interrupt, Betty. No, it's but okay. It's okay. It's quiet. Okay. We much. No, it isn't. <laughs> You're hearing it again? You want to? The artist works in this exhibition derived from manipulation or alteration, hence the word in the title, the first word of the title of the exhibition. They alter existing forms. We'll see text, photography, digital reproduction, and other means of making art making media. <clears throat> They're not primarily process driven without, excuse me, they are primarily process driven without a kind of figurative pictorial drama. Nonetheless, there's a lot of weighty revelatory depth and a kind of aesthetic appeal to the works. In all of them, the hand of the artist is immediately evident in every single work that's on display. I'm going to keep giving you a few introductory comments before we start looking. Abstraction has not been the focus of previous group shows of 21st century artists who either live in the subcontinent by that I only mean India and Pakistan, what else? Uh, or have an attachment to it. Historically, <clears throat> we'll see devotional objects, particularly tantric objects, that have sought to visually represent manifestations of abstract cosmological origin. We're gonna see this in the work of Sohan Kadri, whose sumptuous works on paper are contemporary uh, expressions of that kind of tradition. But in India, in the mid 20th century, 
what artists were responding to was the abex, the abstract expressionist call from the West. But that's not what the abstract works in this exhibition are about. Abstraction is very different now. Rather, artists have sought meaning <clears throat> through the process and actually conversely have found meaning through materials-based practices. One of the artists who we're gonna look at who actually did the work that the title of the exhibition is superimposed on here is an artist named Manisha Parak. And she bemoaned that she had to call her work abstract because, and this is, she said, there is no better word in the English language to identify it. But in my explorations, I came up with another word and the word she may have been seeking was the word haptic, H-A-P-T-I-C, which means of or relating to the sense of touch in particular, relating to the perception and manipulation of objects using the sense of touch. A haptic practice is the uniting, uniting curatorial factor in this exhibition of abstract art. So I'm going to show you the artists in, um, oops, why is it, okay, we gotta move forward here. So I'm going to show you the artists in alphabetical order rather than as they were installed in the gallery, just to be fair to everybody here. Simran Gill had um, a series of works that looked like this one called Egg, egg Drawings. I heard dra egg drawings from 2017 didn't start out to be eggs. She says, the egg drawings started, started life as exercises in perfection, since the objective was to tear a faultless circle. This proved to be impossible, of course, and the results invariably tended towards the ovoid. Her initial desire to use an imperfect method, tearing, as a means to achieve perfection, summons this idea of the Japanese Enzo, that single stroke, brush painted circle that traditional Zen calligraphers often seek to master. Their concentrated effort may aim to create a kind of perfection, but it also recognizes that an imperfect result, an egg rather than a circle, can be accepted as its own, it's its own kind of perfection. Let's look at a detail of her work. So Gill is an ardent collector of the cast off materials that fill her environment and she uses trinkets and wrappers and scraps of paper and pages of text, much of, what, much of which finds its way into, into her work. Materials enliven her, enliven her creativity just as her creativity enlivens them. Hence, the next part of the title of the exhibition, Activation. These odd bits of paper are torn to form the eggs of her egg drawings. Her ovoids are then pasted onto ledger pages, which are most likely a material she has at hand. And actually, I read in one of her catalogs that the ledger pages <clears throat> started out as being pages of an old ledger that had been her father's. So we have this idea of continuity, in addition to the idea of this geometric ground for something very organic, like the, like the egg shapes. The most obvious historic antecedent that came to mind for me was the work of Kurt Schwitters, the Dada artist known for his collages. He elegantly composed these collages from discarded paper, and he almost always included text, which, which Gill does as well. Like Schwitters, Gill's juxtapositions of elements invite viewer interpretation. The next piece I'm going to show you was not in my exhibition, but I'm showing it because it's the piece and the kind of work that first introduced me to Simran Gill's work. And as you can see, there are little bits of text on these beads because they're constructed, <clears throat> that she calls this series, that she did this series for about seven years from 1999 to 20, 2006. She calls the series Pearls because a friend would give her a book and it's so perfect for today. And she would shred the book and make beads out of the shredded text. So this one might be all of War and Peace or some other text. Each one, each, a friend would give her a, a book that was personal or favorite to them. So it kind of works with today's theme. Eh? So I'm not going to give you long biographical, um, and every one of these artists has 
exhibited in uh, good museums and has a, a real nice CV. But I will tell you where they live and work, just so you have an idea of placement and how old they are. Uh, Simran Gill was born in 1959. She lives and works in Sydney, Australia, and in Port Dixon, Malaysia. The next artist is an artist named Tanya Gill, same last name. Um, Tanya says she married into India. Oh, by the way, this installation is called Altered, and you will find out why shortly. She says she married into India, and thus she lives between geographies and cultures. Chandigarh is her husband's family home, and she spends most of her time in Chicago. Seeking a personal unity to adapt to this sort of living in between that she does is analogous to Gill's art making practice. Before I saw these works, she actually was doing inlaid paper. These are a little rougher and have more um, evidence of process and texture in them. But what she does is she meticulously joins different surfaces to create a unified plane in her rafu or darned constructions. So her, her forms begin with a journey. And although Tanya was already living between India and the United States, it wasn't until she was granted a Nehru Fulbright Fellowship in 2012, 2013. She lived in New Delhi for a year then. And that's when her art fundamentally shifted focus to being one of very much self-observation, became much less designy, which the inlaid paper was. And she began adjusting to and merging with her new environment. And so the journey continues. On long family journeys, these are from her sketchbook, there would be these long drives between New Delhi and Chandigarh on the historic Grand Trunk Road, and she would pass the time sketching. And a particular architectural form captured her attention. It's called a barsati. It's, um, it's this sort of roof, rooftop structure that would be um, an accommodation for expanding family needs. It's what in the United States we might call um, a mother-in-law apartment, to be discreet. Um, the various shapes, in other words, mothers on the roof. The various shapes of this simple structure, met, structure actually metaphorically represent the ad adaptation that Gill was seeking. Ultimately, she translates them into pure geometric form. Mm -hmm. The slide isn't moving forward. Okay, hang on. There we go. So this is a detail of the works that are in the altered series. So you, what you have is um, this pure geometric form that she creates in collaboration with Rafugars, professional darners in India. So she sends the materials and the shapes to these people and then they send them back to her. So it's very much a collaboration. In the altered series, thread is darned into pieces of a cloth canopy. So like the previous gill that I showed you, Simran gill, Tanya gill has collected pieces from her environment. She's bought this shrine cover that would have been used during a festival. She bought this textile at a local market in Delhi. It was just a wrapped up piece of red cloth, but she saw its potential as being part of her work. The unfinished cut edge allows threads of warp and weft to be pulled free to produce this sort of delicate, irregular fringe. And then the house shape is created with different color thread darned into the cloth to fill a corresponding hole that was cut by the artist before she sends it to the Rafagar. At the same time, it becomes inseparable from the fabric ground. Tanya Gill has said, it is my compulsion to mimic bringing parts together to make a whole, to unify them. Her technique is analogous, actually, to the human ability to assimilate and at the same time remain individual, to adapt and to remain whole. Tanya Gill was born in Fort Dix, New Jersey in 1970 and she lives and works in Chandigarh, India and in Chicago. The next artist, 
is Rena Collett, who some of you may have met when she was in Chicago with her husband, Jatish Collat, when Jatish was installing the fabulous words of <clears throat> the, uh, the, uh, the word installation on the grand staircase in the Art Institute. So although much of Rena Collett's art also employs text, in Walls of the Womb, which is what this piece is called, this is actually um, an installation shot from an installation that was previous to our installation, which was not dissimilar. Notice please that there's a, um, a vitrine here, and in the vitrine are books, which I will tell you about in just a moment. So legibility, as I said, is not essential. It's the presence of the words, abstracted by having been translated into Braille, that is key. Rena says, I'm interested in thinking of the thing I make as language itself, where meaning is lodged in the material. In this installation, Walls of the Womb, that we have these crimson saris that drape against these deep red walls and they visually embrace the viewer who walks into the installation. The scrolls have been tie-dyed to preserve a pattern of the pure white dots after the silk is bathed in pigment. So let me show you a detail. We may come back to this in a moment, but moving forward, this is a detail of what each one of the silk saris would look like. So once untied, the puckered bandhani, this is from the Sanskrit verb bandha, which means to bind, they remain slightly raised to create a sort of seemingly random, but hardly random all, at all pattern. The pattern of dots created with the same very precise technique as that used by the artisans of Bhuj in India's Kutch Desert, the pattern is braille, as I said. It is a translation of Kalat's mother's handwritten recipe books, which are the texts that were on display in the vitrine in the previous slide. In concept, and in concept only actually, a blind person running sensitive figures, fingers, excuse me, sensitive fingers over the now textured textile could actually read it. But reading is not what this very personal piece is about. Kalat calls it an after presence where images, taste, touch, sounds, and smells have an afterlife. The inscrutable, inscrutable to most of us, that is, the inscrutable text is secondary to the experience of memory. Memory of Collette's mother who died of cancer when the artist was eight years old. The obvious inseparable associations of nature, the womb itself, and nurture, the recipes for the food, make this a specifically feminine work. Further, these scrolls are, take the form of saris. They're not actually saris. Initially, I actually thought that she was using her mother's saris to do these, but what she did was she reproduced the, the traditional shape of a sari in a long strip of cloth. And the word of sari basically means strip of cloth in white silk so that she could then create these memory pieces. Saris though were left behind along with recipes and ephemeral moment mementos that accompanied them. The touch of silk, the scent of her mother that was still embedded in her mother's saris, the taste of gulab jamun that the young artist had all of these embedded in her own memory. So it was sensory engagement with her lost mother's belongings that kept her mother present. And Walls of the Room continues that practice with this abstract portrait. Rina Collett was born in New Delhi in 1973, and she lives and works in Mumbai. These are from a series. These are from a series called the Church Walk Studio that were done by a British artist named Idris Khan. And he lives, in, he lives in London. Although it may appear when we're looking at these that the hand of the artist is missing from Idris Khan's densely layered images, his vision of what a picture should be is not at all absent. The photographic documentary moment, because he uses photo processes, has never been his goal. He pushes these photo processes 
using photomechanical reproduction, copy machines, and scanning, he has no negatives. There's nothing permanent in the materials that he uses. He just keeps repeating. To be, he uses them to become something else. I'm actually jumping ahead by saying, talking about his repetitions. So a little spoiler alert. His aim is to collapse time, to kind of unite the series, even to unite an eternity of moments into an absolutely single image. He has said, the repetitive putting down of layer upon layer of imagery is like a meditation. And we have to think about this. Is not meditation a means to recognize that a moment might actually just be an eternity? The Church Walk series was done in 2015. And it was born of the need to expiate grief. Within a short period that year, Khan's mother had died and his wife had a stillborn child. The artist's studio became his emotional refuge. Each day he would arrive at his studio and he would feverishly write what he was feeling. He would then make a rubber stamp of his words and stamp it onto a piece of paper. Then he would copy that piece of paper and he would put, the next day he would put something else that he wrote on top of it, copy that until these layers kept forming stamping and layering in bursts of energy that were therapeutic, like the repetitive chant, chanting of a mantra. Without advanced knowledge, it's almost impossible to decipher the process that produced these elegant monochromatic C prints. This is a digital rather than a darkroom procedure. Traces of original writing remain as pure abstraction. Khan uses digital reproduction like a painter he uses them the way a painter would use a brush and a rag to create a soft smudge surface. The resulting flattened space really becomes the container. It holds the visual layers of the sorrow that he was feeling at that time. Now I want to show you what first introduced me to Khan's work. This piece is called Every Page of the Holy Quran. And he did it in 2004. And he did it of his father. He was a grad student then, and his father says, why don't you make art about our tradition? And so he took his father's Quran, photographed the first page, took the page that it was printed on, and used that as the ground for reproducing the second page. And he did it all in a copy machine. He was exploring the poetic relationship of making marks. This mechani mechanical processes were his sole tools when he copied every page of the Quran. In doing so, he experienced this sort of physical rhythm of turning every page, itself a kind, again, again a kind of trance-inducing meditation. And he produced the whole volume in one single weighty image. It's no longer legible. It nonetheless represents the essence of the revered book. Idris Khan was born in Birmingham, in Birmingham, England, and he lives and works in 1978, and he lives and works in London. This is an image of a work as I saw it in the artist's studio. This, the artist is, oops, sorry. Daddy, yes, Daddy. I, saw, I saw what happened. I saw it. We're back. You know what? I just wanted to tell you. Um, the your papers are right next to your uh microphone and we're picking up um, a very loud noise every time you move your papers oh okay yeah so sorry move it, move it away from there. okay yeah. i will yeah. got it can you hear it now no okay it's on my lap so shorya kumar pays particular attention to the traces of human intervention and how human touch, whether it's violently destructive as in some of his earlier work or tenderly devotional, can alter the cultural history of a place or object. He recognizes that a repeated gentle touch can change an object. This is demonstrated in his relief sculpture, sculpture Manat from 2018 and in a drawing series that I'll be showing you in a moment called If in a Sacred Land, a Traveler. So this is the piece as 
I first saw it in his studio. And this is the installation at the Tagore Gallery. Manat, the word, roughly translates as promise, oath, or wish, suggesting a promise made to a deity in exchange for a wish that is one hopes to be granted. The manat representing this contract is usually a knot of thread or a string that's been tied onto um, the lattice work of a stone jelly screen at a shrine. In Kumar's interpretation, the jelly is ephemeral. Soot is stenciled onto the wall, which is what we could see in the previous. Those little, the darker parts are the soot that's stenciled onto the wall. And I have to take a little aside from my text here to tell you that when he was installing this in, in late February in New York, a little passageway between next, basically out a side door to the gallery, he set up a, a little furnace to create the soot that would go on each one of his individual stencils for these jolly screens. And he had an assistant basically lying on their back with this, catching the soot from this little coal fire that he had set up, almost like a little hibachi, and then hammering the stencil onto the wall to make the marks all very ghostly indeed. Um, so the strings, those wh the white marks we see on the wall <clears throat> are porcelain. He dips, he makes individual knots. Each one is separate and completely individualized. He'll make a little bunch of strings, dip it in porcelain slip and then fire it to become a ceramic object that each one hangs on an individual nail in this piece. The result mimics the kind of fragile brittleness that characterizes dust-encrusted strings that have been on a shrine for, for long periods of time. But then metaphorically, they also represent the sort of ossified vestiges of old vows. The overall effect, as I said, is ghostly. With a mere dusting or a good wind, Kumar's smoky rendition of a sacred wall covered with the residue of human, human prayers it could just crumble, it, it could blow away. This is from In a Sacred Land, a Traveler. These are two of the individual pieces that are part of a larger installation. So I think this group is all pretty well traveled and we've probably seen shrines where gold leaf is left on the body of a statue or a, uh, an image of a, a deity. A devotee's precious offering at a shrine is the material impetus of Kumar's gold leaf drawings. But it's the artist's touch that really is what indicates reverence. For each individual drawing, and they're all uh, relatively the size of a piece of drawing paper, and then the individual piece of gold leaf is very delicately laid down. It's a very pristine and fragile medium. And then he scratches and subtractively leaves the most minimal of images. It might be schematic bits of architecture, like a kind of jolly screen that we see on the, on the left here. Or <clears throat> it could, in some of the other ones, there are map-like grids or, or contour drawings of sacred objects. But for me, the most evocative of all are ones that are like the one on the right, where it's a simple abstract geometric form a kind of linear pattern. Here's what the whole piece looked like installed. So there were all these individual gold drawings on white and they just popped and they were on, placed in the gallery at a place where at certain times of day they caught the sunlight. So it was very magical. <clears throat> in both Manat and If in the Sacred Land as Traveler, the materials couldn't be more opposite. Yet both are manifestations of accumulated memory. They take as their inspiration the vestiges of prayers. These are the kinds of things that mark a sacred object or a site. Kumar's meticulous mounting of both of these inspires, however, a different kind of reverence. They become the kind of reverence for pure art objects because they, they have been moved out of their sacred space into that sort of new temple, the art gallery. But he has a very strong aesthetic sense 
in this in this moving the piece from one um, avatar to the next. Oh, backing up just a moment. Shoya Kumar was born in New Delhi in 1979, and he lives and works in Chicago. This next artist is Manish Nye. Some of you may have seen his work at the Kavi Gupta Gallery in Chicago. And <clears throat> it would be facile to view Manish Nye's compressed columns and cubes through their form alone. <clears throat> we can't just see them as outposts of the pared down to its basic geometry minimalism. But like minimal, minimalists, Nye is devoted to pure abstraction and his materials can see, excuse me, even though he is devoted to pure abstraction, his materials kind of tease the viewer into other associations. So let's look at a detail of one of these. They, they're about, um, as you can see, they're tall, 70, uh, taller than a, a person. So this is a, a detail. <clears throat> Close inspection of his towers <clears throat> abuse clothes. They, the clothes are his family's, he says. They reveal the sort of personality and embedded memories of their former wearers, not unlike Rina Kalat's mother's saris, I guess. In earlier works of, of Manai's, the clothing was compressed into square cubes, but in these current iterations, he's greatly elongated the finished product, and he's let bits of wood, um, the wood support, show through where the clothing isn't, he used to just pack the whole thing full. But now, as we saw in this previous one, you can see that there are some empty spaces of wood, like here at the top, at the bottom. In here, you see a little gap, and in other places as well. So he's leaving this, these stretches of wood unclothed, and he may have been inspired by the growth of his own children, actually, whose discarded garments are his medium. The revealed wooden pole is like the limbs of a lanky teenager whose clothes don't quite fit anymore. So implicit narrative is a distinguishing factor in Nye's work. And via narrative, one can kind of link Nye to the genre of art making that's called process art, in which the end product is not the principal creative focus. But by starting with an object of, that already is something, and in addition to clothing, he's used jute and he's used crumbled up old Indian newspapers, um, Manish Nai retains his personal engagement with the original material. But at the same time, he's reshaping it. He says, I believe in process. I can only understand how things work once I put my hands in it. End quote. But just as one cannot actually pigeonhole Nye as being a process artist or as strictly being a minimalist artist, we have to consider his engagement. He can't be pigeonholed. We have to consider that his engagement with process does focus on an end, end product. His work is both about process and the meanings inherent in the materials he uses. Process is vital to his aesthetic, of course, but essentially it's the visual evidence of his narrative content told by using unrefined materials to create a minimalist vocabulary of very simple geometric forms. Manish Nye was born in Gujarat in 1980 and he lives and works in Mumbai. A Secret Within is a work by um, Manisha Parekh, who I mentioned earlier. It was her piece that was the backdrop for the title of my slides here today. As her practice moves easily from medium to medium, form and texture remain paramount in Marisha, uh, Manisha Parekh's um, practice. She employs, employs calligraphic brushwork, Excuse me, I skipped ahead. I want to talk about this piece. I was moving on to another piece. I said earlier about Manisha Parekh that um, 
she thought that the word abstract was only the best available word in the English language. And as completely abstract as her visual vocabulary may be, her creative process takes personal narrative as its muse. Her visual vocabulary is very much indebted to the living craft traditions of India, especially fiber and textile. This piece is jute rope that has, is wrapped around a core harder piece of, of rope. So it's almost like the kinds of um, macrame work that was done a long time ago. But the forms become these beautiful, almost linear expressions, although they're quite bulky. This covered a fairly large wall. She has said that her favorite inspirational space is the Craft Museum in New Delhi. There, in addition to the superb collection, and I'm sure many of you have visited the Craft Museum, there are active workshops of contemporary artisans where one can experience that sort of relationship between maker and material out in the back in the garden behind the museum. And Parak employs an equally hands-on approach in her own often experimental creative process. So in a secret we, within, we see these organic fluid shapes as a result of, the, of her being motivated by the nature of her diverse materials. There's seven rope, rope sculptures here and they're arranged on a colored wall. And it's seemingly random because each time this work is installed, it's, its shape is determined by the available space. It's kind of like the musical notes uh, written on a page that can be interpreted for a small chamber performance or for a large symphony concert. The wall color changes with each installation, so do the cast shadows, and the, the whole thing becomes further individualized each time it's shown. These are her series called Indigo Clouds, and <clears throat> she's using calligraphic brushwork in each of them. And the brushwork was inspired by her experiments in the material she used when she did an, a residency in 2013 in Japan at the Aomori Contemporary Art Center. Like Zen ink strokes, each of her indigo clouds, as she calls them, demonstrates the weight of the brush at various junctures. So we can see the ink being very dense, say in this part of the brush stroke and then softening here. Whether by pressure on the brush or the density of the ink itself, a diverse range of opacity and transparency is evident in each of these drawings. The dark clouds themselves seem to float above a gathering of smaller seed-filled amoeboid organisms. I've got one more so we can get another look. It was a beautiful series in the way that you can almost see um, how she flowed from one to the next as they're numbered. Manisha Park was born in Gujarat in 1964, and she lives and works in New Delhi now. Antonio Puri, this is called Cinquenta Dos a Diez. Antonio Puri was born in India, but he resides in Colombia. And it's no wonder he doesn't want to identify or be pegged to any specific geography. He prefers what he calls a non-identity. The dualities that he experiences as a global nomad, east and west, time and timelessness, attachment and detachment, all of these resolve themselves in his personal journey of abstract art making. That does not, however, prevent Puri from being autobiographical. His practice can include fingerprints or the soil of his native Chandigarh embedded in layers of natural pigment. The linear elements on the surface of his works, which you might be able to see here, there's gonna be a more detailed work coming up, are the result of a process that for him has deep spiritual significance. He says, I use strings as a metaphor for attachment. Then I remove the strings as part of my personal detachment to, to this world. This series, Cinquenta, is homage to Corbusier as well as to Chandigarh, the artist's birthplace, of course, but it was also 
the first planned city of independent India. It was designed by the Swiss French architect Le Corbusier. And like concrete slabs, Puri's layered monochrome canvases form a sensuously textured wall. Here, his signature string technique has the appearance of the encrustations of nature that actually could embellish such a wall. Let's look at this next piece. I think you'll get a better idea. This is a smaller piece. Um, it's basically the size, uh, each, each slab is the size of a piece of drawing paper, uh, like maybe uh, 11 by 14 or so. 16, by, excuse me, 16 by 24. It's a little bigger than I'm imagining. And in the exhibition, because of the Chandigarh connection, it was installed um, framing a corner. So one, they were on perp each side was on a perpendicular wall, right near the works by Tanya Gill, the Rafugar pieces altered that um, were also inspired by Chand the, the, the travel to Chandigarh. This piece is called Antashkaran, and it's a further hom homage to Le Corbusier. There are these two canvases that open like a book color, cover, excuse me, but they reveal multi-layered, a kind of visual surprise in the spine of, um, that get to show the artist's process. The surface have his characteristic string and gray and sort of concrete looking embedded, um, embedded materials. But the, but the revelation of these different materials are like the raw marks that Le Corbusier deliberately allowed to remain in his poured concrete buildings. The difference is that Corbu thought of these as exposed muscle of his buildings, and Puri sees his as revelation of the life process, sort of the timeline of his work. Antonio Puri was born in Chandigarh, as I said, in 1966, and he lives and works in Bogota. In my introductory comments, I referred to um, Sohan Kadri. Sohan Kadri was a tantrika, but he trained early on in the classic discipline of oil. Ultimately, he discarded it. It was sort of for him like a release from the trappings of the physical world in favor of inks and dyes. His mature style can be understood in actually in tantric terms. The penetration of rough artisanal paper and the absorption of color. Kadri releases inks and dyes from a loaded brush and invites serendipity, but it's not, it's not a chaotic serendipity but it's one that's controlled by disciplined practice, like his Tantra practice. In Nietzsche, this piece from 2008, in fact, all of the works I'm showing you are from 2008, we see punctured dots that bisect the, the paper and dampened incised lines. In each of these, drink deeply of the kind of proffered liquid that Kadri draw, uh, um, but now it doesn't really splash it on them. He pours it into them with this loaded brush. And it creates this curtain of concentrated color. In Sanskrit, the word nitya actually means continual, perpetual, or eternal, like the cascade depicted. But nitya could also mean ordinary or even usual. So the Kadri's title for this work then indicates his understanding that something ordinary could also be eternal. These two pieces um, called Agamas are two of many of Kadri's paintings that are in the form of yantras. Yantras are devotional diagrams. And in these two similarly formatted paintings, Kadri has designed a grid for tantric meditation. In Agamas, the, one, the piece on the left, the devotee can travel with his mind from one square to the next, pausing at each one to focus on a central dot or bindu. In the piece on the, on the right, Agamas 3a, each bindu actually is free of an encasing grid. They float in two horizontal rows surrounded by an indigo ocean.
Amisha 6 illustrates a path of energy within an abstract framework <clears throat> that actually relates to the human spine. This powerfully layered central column in this work is pulsating with energy emanating from its edges. Chakras, a center of spiritual energy in the human body represented, often represented by a circle or wheel are suggested here only by suggestion as the three small white dots or they're actually punctures in the work at the top and the bottom. The base is enclosed by a fence and this is symbolic actually, making known that entry into this system, this tantric system of self-knowledge is uh, indeed difficult. You have to get past the fence. Ultimately, Tantra is the defining factor. Kadri, in addition to being a painter, as I said, was a tantric, tantric guru. He has said, art can have the same effect as meditation, but only if we drop our constantly interpreting mind and learn to see. This can happen if you grasp, grasp the painting at a subliminal level. Let it filter in through your pores. Kadri was born in Chachoki in the Punjab in India in 1932. He died in 2011. And during most of his life, he lived and worked, his adult life, he lived and worked in Copenhagen and in Toronto. This is work by Edward Rothfarb. Edward does not have a biological uh, heritage that is Indian, as you can tell by his name here, but he does have a, um, an academic and cultural attachment. And I saw these works in his studio about a year before I curated the show. I'd actually started curating it. And I just said, Ed, I have to have these. And I did. And he was very cooperative and wonderful to work with. So we saw jolly screens in the work of Shorya Kumar, but the jolly for Ed's work has a different purpose. The, it, the jolly screens, as we know, are these stone screens that are perforated with intricate geometric patterns. And these, these screens are common in both Hindu and Islamic courtly architecture. They were the visual starting point for Ed Rothfarb's recent drawings. Represent, representational depictions started for him as a practical ex exercise to lead him back into art making after a, a hiatus in academia. Ed got a PhD at, from UCLA in the courtly architecture of Orcha. Uh, in an earlier avatar, he was a professor and a ceramic artist. He was a professor at Rhode Island School of Design and a ceramic artist before he became an academic. Um, he's truly a Renaissance man. It soon evolved into a mental exercise. It, by it, I mean his, his doing, copying these images of jolly screens, became this mental exercise of solving geometric puzzles. They became the ground for Rothfarb's imagination. But he wanted to use these drawings over and over again. And so to avoid the labor intensive process of reproducing a drawing from scratch, he he created digital multiple, multiples of them and he created them in different sizes on Arch's drawing paper so that he could use them to draw on, add to, erase, subtract from. In map two, the jolly is barely revealed. It actually acts as a substructure for the activity on the surface, which is this, um, and I'm pointing at my screen with my finger, which doesn't work, this river, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Some of the buildings are actually identifiable as those along the Ghats in Varanasi. So that indicates that the river is the Ganges. And looking like watered silk, the river charges into the drawing from the upper left. This could be charging in from the Himalayas. It then, so up here, the river comes into the drawing. It cuts across the paper. in the center and then it gets pinched as it descends here. And then we have these um, sunspots hitting the water. And then from there we see tumultuous storm clouds, 
probably don't need to point all this out to you. It's pretty obvious. Then ultimately, the river gently proceeds to the bottom of the page, and it looks more like curling ribbon that's been discarded after a gift's been unwrapped. So we see these various personalities of the Ganges as it flows from the mountains through Varanasi. Rivers seem to be a recurring theme in, in their abstracted form in Ed Rothfarb's work. And <clears throat> in this piece from 2018, he uses many of the same elements, but both composition and imagery are further abstracted. The jollies are miniaturized and used as standalone devices. In fact, the one in the middle is actually not one of his drawings. He uses photographic reproductions as well here. Although something like this would be one of his drawings and um, these little pieces in here. And, and basically the whole, all the ground in the back, the black and tan that we see are his drawings that are <coughs> used as the ground for the movement of the rivers. But in these, the drawings are stacked vertically and they create a field for the descending rivers that appear to have, rivers seem to have deconstru deconstructed the geography of a simple rectangular format. The three most holy rivers in India are the Ganges, the Yamuna, and the Saraswati. The Saraswati long ago dried up is a fabled presence and Rothfarb's rivers, one blue, one textured. Can you hear voices coming from another room now, guys? Somebody let me know. I'm gonna just shut a door so we have more silence, excuse me. Sorry about that. So <clears throat> the Saraswati, as I said, long ago dried up. It's merely a fabled presence. But Rothfard's rivers, one blue and one <clears throat> very much in the palette of desert camouflage, are both textured with movement and punctuated by storms. They may depict, actually, the Ganges and the Yamuna, or they may simply depict the duality of Indian seasons dictated by monsoons. Let's look at a detail of this. So you can see the two, uh, the, the Blue River and then the more dried up geometrically formed river and some um, fairly close views of the kinds of architectural plans as well as the jelly screens, some storms, etc. Rothfarb has a connoisseur's comfort with the arts of India, particularly painting and architecture. Buildings in his drawings often take the splayed form that is employed in Rajput paintings. And the vertical narratives of Bengali Pata, the cloth scroll paintings, along with symbolic maps of pilgrimage paths, further inspire him. In fact, one could say that all of India has become Ed Rothfarb's pilgrimage map and his muse for that matter. His journeys have resulted in a union of art historian and artist. Ed Rothfarb was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1950, and he lives and works in Los Angeles. So the last artist I'm gonna show you is Niha Bedpatek. This is called Those Places, and the detail on the left really gives you an idea of her process, which I'll describe in just a second. Niha Bedpatek's early career as an abstract minimalist painter took a formative per to, excuse me took a formative turn in 1929 when she started looking for ways to take her two-dimensional practice in a, in a new direction in fact she was looking really to work with less toxic materials and it led her to japanese paper japanese paper was already already in her repertoire <clears throat> but she transformed this familiar material into swaths of textured sheets that became the components for these large wall pieces. They're huge. That are both paintings and collages. But Patek's process appears simple. Using a pushpin, she plucks artisanal Japanese paper, separating its fibers to create a randomly open, flexible ground. It's a lengthy and very rigorous process. 
using really just a, a push pin. She'll have this big piece of Japanese paper on her work, uh, her work table and just sit there with the push pin. And it, it becomes, the process itself becomes integral, an integral force in her work. Sometimes days, even months will go by that she'll be spent plucking paper. But as she says, time plucking is time ruminating. For Vedpatek, plucking paper has become a kind of ritual of transformation, a slowing down, a meditation. So these are both painted and collage. So she will take these pieces of plucked paper, paint into them, and then assemble them into the larger pieces. This last piece, I chose a quiet piece for the last piece, is called Rain. In addition to materials and processes being her inspiration, the artist's investigation of her physical environment are key to their creation. Since she came to the United States in the early 2000s, Nihavet Patek has lived in urban centers. She's lived in Chicago, she li she's lived in Tucson, and she is also now living in Detroit. Rain, this piece, from 2013, could have been inspired by any of them, but I kind of see it as that feel of a, of a desert downpour that when the arrival of rain is this celestial delight. This almost pure white construction, it appears almost to be tinged with sand in places. It conjures that moment, that moment in a downpour when colors disappear and water is all that is visible. Yet rain retains the serendipity of Vetex plucking. Creative, evocative shadows are there as light penetrates its lace-like holes. I'm gonna stop with that piece. Um, I'm going to stop the share here. You can always go back to it and look at pieces if you want to. And come back to all of you. Betty, this was great. For a discussion, thank you, Barbara. Um, there was a lot of material here and I'm grateful for your patience with all of it. Um, sorry about the paper noise and interfering noise here. I thought I had that covered. Yeah, but one thing struck me as I was reviewing my notes for all of this, that I hadn't been part of my initial curatorial mission was the, the place of meditation in all of these works. And it made me think about how important that is. And I go back to Diane's fabulous presentation last week. Thank you again. Betty? Yes, Barbara. Could you, could you get us a list of the artists so that Absolutely. we can pursue Absolutely. on our own? Absolutely. Or what I can do is I can send you the link to the gallery and all of the artists are listed in the, and you can look at the catalog. Fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah, I'll do that. Betty, I had another question. Of course, this is a time of um, quarantine, but um, what do you think? Can we get this Tanya Gill to maybe talk about her work? Oh, yeah, she's in Chicago. She's fabulous and she's very articulate. Yeah. Her, her work is outstanding. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, I can, I can ask her if she'd be willing to do that and then I can put her in touch with you, Barbara. I would, yeah, also, okay. like, I would also like to see Kumar's work more. Sure, yeah? Yeah. I have lots of images and he's in Chicago and also extremely articulate about his work. I would like, especially, what I wasn't, what I really didn't understand, I mean, the process is part of all of these these creations, but I would really like to know the string, the string and slip. You know, I how does how does anybody come up with something like that that is so esoteric? Talk I mean, about your materials inspiring you, huh? He's he, yeah, he's a he's a professor at SAIC, um, and he is in the printmaking department. Yeah. Earlier works, he would take an image of a site, um, and the one that that introduced me to his work first of all was he would did take a digital image of a site that has been destroyed the one that is most obvious to me are the the destruction of the the great buddhas that the taliban destroyed oh. then he would take this demo, digital image he's so smart it's scary <laughs> he would take this digital image and change it by one you know 
these are binary codes. One little thing, and then print it again so that the, the image of the Buddhas would become a palimpsest of, of memory. And again, it's, it, it, what I said earlier is that he's interested in human touch on sites and shrines. And so in that way, uh, whether it's gentle, like the application of gold leaf at a shrine, or the dis complete destruction of a place, like what the Taliban, Taliban did in Bamiyan. Now, I, would, but, I, would, I would like to engage. I can ask each of them if they'd be interested in doing a presentation for us or before before we uh, leave him um, in in uh, if in a sacred land I had no idea how large those individual pieces were and if there it's was the size of a traditional piece of gold leaf which if you look at my hands is maybe yeah. like that okay. maybe a little bigger one he uses one piece of gold leaf and he lays it down perfectly. And if anyone's ever worked with gold leaf, you know that it just crumbles. Yeah. Absolutely crumbles in your hands. So he's very much a perfectionist. Okay. Um, yeah. Setting up the yeah. mana piece was really, <laughs> it was performance art watching that go up. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Ed's work was unbelievable. I've never seen it. Oh, Barbara knows Ed. Yeah. Ed's, Ed's a Los Angeles friend. Yeah. He's great. I mean, ah, he's remarkable. I didn't even know he, I, I had, um, Ed has been a, a friend and colleague for a long time. And I was visiting him once when he was first starting to do the jelly drawings. And I figured, Ed, you know, this is a guy who's done ceramic art. He's been in the food business. He's done, he's done so much in his 70 years. That's re he's remarkable. Um, but he's doing these drawings and I'm thinking, you're just copying Jollies, what's going on here? And I had no idea where it was going to take him, but obviously it took him someplace remarkable. Mm -hmm. Okay, kiddos, thank you. Thank this you. Was, this was really fantastic. fantastic. Thank you, Barbara. Well, I, I saw some things thank that you. I've never, you know, seen before and uh, you know, the show was beautifully installed. I highly recommend your following Sundaram Tagore Gallery. I'll send you the, all the links. I'll send it to everyone. Um, because he got, mostly deals with abstraction, which Sundaram has, oh, interestingly, which I meant to mention early on, and I forgot to do this. He is a descendant of the Tagore family that Shoma spoke about through an uncle. And he's a very, he, um, he ironically does not show that many Indian artists, but I've known him through um, professional associations for ages. And we both came out of graduate school at about the same time and joined an Indian art, the American Council for Southern Asian Art and found each other and talked about how I had been, at the time was interested in an artist, Francesco Clemente, who used India as his inspiration. And he was interested in Indian artists who took the West for the inspiration in his work. So we went back and forth about this. And, and, and uh, I believe in karma because I kept running into him at symposia everywhere. And we've since become good friends, but he doesn't show that many Indian artists. So he came to me and said, would ask me, invited me to curate this exhibition because he wanted to have um, an Indian show that would be up at, at around the same time that the Asia Society did their big tribute to Indian mid-century Indian modernism. Oh. It, our show ended up going up later, but it wasn't that much later. And there's going to be um, a, another big show of Indian contemporary art coming to, uh, to New York soon. I'm not sure exactly what the iteration is gonna be. It's a beautiful gallery. Yeah, it is a beautiful gallery. And they have two locations. Yeah, he's in Hong Kong. Uh, but I thought he had two locations in New York. No, not anymore. Not anymore. Uh, okay. Because they he had got an uptown location for a while. He was actually in Los Angeles for a while, um, in Beverly Hills. He was on um, on Little Santa Monica. Because they had also featured a, an exhibit by uh, Prabir Pupiastra, who was one of our participating artists in the Following the Box project. Right. 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 A beautiful show. Yeah, but mostly he shows abstraction. Um, and from people and not some Asians, all over, 
uh, he's all over with that. It, it's, he's not uh, geographically bound by any particular culture. Okay, guys, thank you. Thank you. Thank Pleasure you. to be with you today. See you next week. Yep. Bye. Nice talking to everybody. A few, not announcements really, but next week, Michael is going to talk to us about Paris and his Paris and back areas that most of us don't get to see. And the following week, Jack is going to bring us as up to date as possible um, because it changes every week on um, what's useful to know with the virus wow. and how we can safely reemerge if that happens at the end of this month. And I've got lots more people who I can call on to present and I'm hoping we'll just go on for a while because there's a lot of talent in this group, a lot of interests. And, you know, what, what I'm thinking of doing, and I'd love to have your input, is just say this is 2.15 on Sundays and whoever joins, joins. Thoughts? Yes. Sounds good. Sure. Because all of you are resources. <laughs> and as I as I was saying, we you might consider our little book review after my talk. I mean, the following week, if you want to. I mean, if you've got something else, I've got Mara. Okay, who's Not already signed up, and I haven't talked to a few of you. I've got Alan who's going to do uh, follow the box. So that's four weeks. All right. Mara was you at the show at Loyola? Yes. Yes. I was there. Ah, thank you. I sat Thanks. with you and your wife. Yep. Hmm? I remember. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't seen you since then. So this That's is great. That's correct. Betty sent me. Great. And Madhu sent me, and it was a period where I don't know if I had sciatica or what, but I kept hobbling around on a cane and sitting down a lot. <laughs> and leaning against walls that were free, but what a show. What a show. Thank you. Well, I'm eager to talk about it. So what?